started. Well, uh, I want to thank you very much for coming to our session or symposium. I really mean, I, it's, it's almost a dinner time, and people have their dinner plan, even some people are already gone from the conference for their dinner or other events. I truly appreciate that you take the time to come to listen to us. So our today's session is going to focus on, as you can see on the slides, developing our multi-tier evidence-based program for individuals with autism through the cultural lens. That's what I had. It's not in the title. So ensuring collaboration among all the stakeholders. I am Mian Wang, and uh, I'm a professor of special education at UC Santa Barbara. It is my great pleasure as this symposium chair to welcome you and to introduce you to a line of wonderful speakers that will probably leave you in awe and amazement, as well as perhaps even wondering if all the speakers somehow discover a way to stretch 24 hours a day to accommodate their multitude of talents. So I'm going to e introduce each speaker. So why introduce them? They will just stand up so you can kind of make a connection with who. So first up, I have the one and only Dr. Dimitris Dimitris from Grace. Well, welcome, please. Yay! Yeah. 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 This is the multifaceted polymath, I would call that, the pediatric dram, with a resume that seems to define the boundaries of space and time. Dr. Dimitris holds an MD in developmental pediatrics not to mention his other degree in political science and Middle East studies. He also did his postdoc at Yale, I believe at the Child Study Center. It's a very renowned uh, place for our pediatric training. And if that all though was not impressive enough, he also speaks a staggering 17 languages. I myself feel proud about speaking four languages, but he speaks 17 languages. And I wouldn't be even surprised that uh, if Dimitris was actually maybe translating some ancient Greek text during your lunch break, <laughs> just to speak about the language talent. So, so, and maybe I, did, did I mention that actually he also has two clinics yes. in two different countries? So this one is truly a force to be reckoned with. So you're going to learn a, a lot of important uh, information of the work that he has done. Next, I, we have delightful Dr. Lindsay Grugat, who effortlessly juggles the roles of a board certified behavior analyst, lecturer, and dog walking huge, with over a decade of clinical experience in the field of applied behavior analysis. Uh, really, Lindsay, I believe, has Earned, uh, earned the expertise uh, in naturalistic interventions, social skill, and pyramided magic trick. Yeah, I'm kidding. <laughs> but isn't that something, magic, key, magic tricks? He will tell you more in, in her presentation. So now let's welcome the illustrious Dr. Sunny Kim. Uh, Dr. Kim uh, holds a PhD in Special Education, Disability, and Risk Studies from UCSB. Not only is she a board-certified behavior analyst, is also a certified in P PRT, uh, stands for Pivotal Response Treatment uh, Model. And Dr. Kim's de uh, dedication to improving the lives of individuals with behavior challenge is truly remarkable. As the program manager and the course coordinator at UC Santa Barbara, he's working very hard to ensure that the next generation of behavior analysts is equipped with the knowledge and the skill to make a difference in people's life. Last, but certainly not least, we have a, another wonderful speaker, Dr. Kat Katarina Ford. Also, a board certified behavior analyst and a certified PRT uh, clin clinician. Dr. Ford's passion lies in training parents, educators, and professionals to 
uh, in, to implement evidence-based uh, practice. Armed with a BA in psychology and PhD in special education, she now is imparting her wisdom and her experience to a lot of eager minds as a lecturer at the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at UC Santa Barbara. Whether he's diving into the complexity of applied behavior analysis or delving into the intricacy of the human brain, Dr. Ford's expertise is both enlightening and empowering. I hope you find that in her presentation. Well, as we embark, we are embarking on this almost two hour long journey of discovery and laughter, hopefully, some, let's all appreciate the fact that behind the impressive professional ac accomplishment and the wealth of knowledge, our speakers are human beings with a zest for life, laughter, and perhaps the occasionally wild deserved nap. So sit back, relax, and get ready to be informed, inspired, and thoroughly, sorry, thoroughly entertained by our brilliant, brilliant speakers. Without further ado, take it away, guys. So, hi, everybody. Nothing? Come on. Let's get the party started. So, I'm so happy to be here with you today. So I came from Greece, my name is Dimitri, okay? Or Mimi in Chinese and Japanese, because it's difficult to pronounce Dimitri. And I would like to thank, xie xie. Okay, Professor yeah. Mian, okay? Who actually studied also in Greece. So he speaks also Greek. Okay, and I would like to thank my wonderful team, and foremost, Dr. Sami Kim, okay? Who actually invited me to become an advisory board member with his brilliant colleagues. So, multicultural. So, people are changing. Socrates, the great philosopher, actually never left Athens. He stayed his whole life in Athens. And before he was actually killed by poison, okay, because he was deemed not to be good for the young, for the young, he's, he was offered the possibility in exile, he said, no, we we'll stay in my hometown. So our hometown is the planet Earth. And the recent pandemic showed us that we have to be culturally competent in order to apply all that we have learned. Because things and societies change. So we're going to be talking about power and education, multicultural training, embedded cultural beliefs and values. So basically, my PhD was psychosocial child development in a transcultural environment, which I applied to what I've learned in the, in the, the last few years. Ever since I came to the States in 2008, I did part of my postdoc in Yale, and there I realized that a lot of the things I was learning couldn't be applied to Greece. Why? Because most of the tools were in English, okay? Because most of the habits, like in Vineland or anything else, that people would follow and put as goals were unplayable, didn't exist at the time for Greece. For example, small things like microwaves. We wouldn't use microwaves back then. It was only 14 years ago. And when I was telling them that our teenagers should use microwaves, people were laughing. You know why? Because it was incomprehensible to them that the mother would not cook fresh food for, his, for her son. So that changed the things that I wanted to teach for other cultures, for my culture as well. Okay, I haven't been, I haven't been in a place, I'm in this stable place for the last 14 years. I come and go every month to the States. I teach all over the world. And I have clinics over the world as well. So, 10% of the world's population has access to evidence-based practices such as therapy rooms and MBA and IPLT. Recently, I was in Nepal. 
in Nepal, it was in January, I think. And Nepal is about India, between India and Tibet, and they have only one BCBA. Many countries in Europe have fewer than 10 BCBAs. So why is that? So that might be, for example, the lack of knowledge of language. That might be because of the cost of the work and of the cost of the training. So two ways to view, as I say here, cultural diversity. The local therapist, familiar with the culture and language, but trying to implement an intervention that was developed in a different country. So believe me, when I went back to Greece for a brief time, period of time in 2009, it was really hard for me to train people what I had learned. The terminology was simply not there, okay? And the tools we were supposed to use, we couldn't use them. The language was different, the language of therapy was different, and the language as a structure is different, and this goes the same as in Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and many other languages that don't follow the Indo-European way. Foreign therapists, like an American therapist, trying to implement or, or teach an intervention to a group with minimal familiarity with the cultural language. So for example, how does this apply to us? During the pandemic, we've been training a lot of people from abroad, like from Dubai, Middle East, and, and Korea, I think also, etc., etc. Et I mean, from Turkey, from Greece, from Cyprus, lots of countries. So if you try to implement an intervention where you don't know the language, you don't know the culture, you might come up against a lot of obstacles. For example, a month ago was the Ramadan, was the Muslim holiday. So we couldn't actually have a, a specific kind of therapy because they were ready during the whole day, okay? And for example, during certain times they had to go for prayer. And the same goes, for example, for the Greek Orthodox Easter that we have the Lent, etc., etc. So we've had other times religious things, other times language barriers, and other times things that we simply didn't expect that we would find. So we're going global, never take anything for granted. Some countries said the disciplines have taken over the autism therapy and it's whole. For example, my strongest, let's say, experience was in Turkey. In Turkey, they have wonderful therapists, wonderful, but not enough speech therapists. So who has taken over the autism therapy? Speech and special education teachers. Well, in that ground, I have to say that special education teachers were wonderful, but they didn't focus so much on communication, they focused on the cognitive elements of the education. And I was trying to explain to them that communication, as the MBA, PRT, is not knowing what an apple is, but what people can do with the apple, how do you interact having an apple in your hand? But they thought that labeling was enough for communication, which is not. So interaction is viewed in many disciplines differently, or is not viewed at all. And the same goes for cultures, okay? For example, in some Asian cultures, Oriental cultures, it's, it's, it's an insult to look someone directly in the eyes, okay? Or to touch. So, cognitive goals were hijacked, big hijack our communication goals. Not all therapists are necessarily available in different countries. Some interventions are in goals cannot be adapted or is deemed as being not appropriate in some cultures. For example, especially with tactile practices. First, adapt as therapists and try to learn so as much as you can about the culture. And second, tackle the language barrier. I speak Turkish fairly fluent, fluently, and other languages like Arabic, okay, a little Chinese, a little Japanese as well, and we Nepali. So how did that help me? Okay, we'll see that in the coming presentations. Understand the language structure in order to advance the children, because English is a very straightforward language. It has no inclinations. Okay, it has very simple tenses sometimes, 
okay, but this doesn't apply to all languages. So you have to learn to speak the language or at least understand how some language, how some languages work. For example, if you say I want in Greek, it's thel. So what's the problem with that word? The problem as with want is that you cannot model it easily. Why? Because it's behind the P. So children cannot imitate easily the word. So I would start my therapy with another word that people, the children, could imitate because they could see. And the same goes with many other languages. Like the therapy it is istiguro. In, in Spanish is quiero. So we had a lot of problems with that. Or in Russia, okay, verbs like I am don't exist. And other languages may not have plural, may not have or may have inclinations. So the knowledge per language is incorrect. So the dress code, okay. I found it very hard to train directly women therapists in some countries, especially Oriental countries. Okay, and in other countries, the, the role of the sex or the gender, okay, was inhibitory in many cases. How come? Because in some cases, women would like to be taught by women. And in some other cases, I know it sounds strange, but people wouldn't accept a woman as an instructor, would want a man as an instructor, because that's how their mentality and their culture was. It was a patriarchal society. So these things we should know beforehand. Otherwise, our program would not work. So when I went to our countries, I told them the father and the mother should always be present at the therapy and at the training. And the father was quite apprehensive. They didn't want to be trained. They didn't want to be in the, in the session. Why? Because they did that the role of the mother was taking care of the child and they shouldn't have anything to do with that. They thought actually that training their child was masculine. Okay, that, that's strange, but that was it. So, food variety and habits. Okay, choosing a habit for eating. If you go to India, you don't eat with the right hand. You cannot eat in the palm of the same, you cannot eat with the left hand. So, for example, the way you use your hands in ABA when you teach how to use both of your hands, Okay? can be tricky in some cultures because you cannot use feeding, the feeding process for teaching these procedures. Nonverbal communication may be very like some gestures. For example, if you do this in Greece, that's an insult. If you do this, it's okay. But this is an insult. The same goes for the thumbs up. Thumbs up, for example, for us, it's okay, well done. But if you go to Iran or other countries over there, it's a very bad insult. And also pointing out somebody with your feet might be an insult in some oriental cultures. So you have to be careful how you teach your goals and how you implement them as well, and who also implement the thing you teach. And people will sometimes be embarrassed to tell you so that you were wrong. Okay, they will just not do it. Or they say, thank you, you're great, but they want meaning. So usually what do we do? We go through locals, okay? I go to a country and I stay there for a couple of days and I tell them, invite me if you can to your house. I want to see how you live. I don't want to see how you do, how, how for example, you eat. Even the toilet might differ. In some countries, they don't have the Western toilet. So when you are supposed to teach toilet training, you have to be aware of these things. Some cultures don't use paper, toilet paper. And this sounds funny, but when you're teaching an autistic child, it is a very big difficulty. Okay? There was, in many cases, this connection between the medical aspect and intervention goals. Why is that? Because in some societies, some cultures, Doctors just diagnose 
but they don't put the codes, they don't set the codes. Some medical discipline may not be recognized and may not exist, like developmental theatrics. Developmental theatrics doesn't exist in all societies, in all countries, for example, in, in, in Europe, in France, or in Germany, developmental theatrics don't exist. They know it's there, but it doesn't exist, or even in Greece it's not recognized. I, in Greece, I'm a general pediatrician, although my PhD in my training is on developmental theatrics. Okay, not only that. So, uh, expertise by US standards could be limited. So what people actually know might not be the same thing like you know. So, in 2011, Professor Fred Walkman sent me to, to UCSB. That's where I met Sunny Kim, Dr. Sunny. Right, remember your training, PRT. Yeah. yeah, so that's when we became friends with Sunny. I'm proud to call him that, seriously. Don't tell me that I'm lying. <laughs> so, basically, when I went there, they just started training me and teaching me things, but I realized that I wasn't aware of what they were teaching me. Because why? Because, first of all, as a medical doctor, I didn't have the background of behavioral therapy, behavioral, let's say, norms and laws, okay, that were supposed to guide me through the training. And coming from Greece, that meant that I didn't have generally the same background in ABA especially. So they took it for granted that I knew, but Dr. Sunny realized that. And she explained more and more and more and more the basics. So never take anything for granted. We are doing online sessions with people from abroad. I've got patients, for example, online in Australia, I do parent coaching with the states, with Arab countries. I never take anything for granted. So I teach them something, I tell them how to do it, I also send a video, and then I tell them, tell me an example. Describe me how you will do that. Most of the times, you know what? They don't do it as I say. Okay? They haven't even imagined that it's going to be done like that. So I know this, I'm prepared. I don't put them down. So what do I do? Tell them, okay, let's take step by step, step by step. And then I analyze what I didn't understand their culture. And then I have them send a video and I do a comment on that, a commenting on how this should be implemented. So, cost of training per, per country. For example, in Nepal, the cost of training is around, is between five and fifteen dollars, US dollars. In Athens, in Greece, it's between twenty to thirty dollars. In Europe, it might be something like $50, but in New York, it's 150 to 200. Is it correct? Yeah. So, if somebody's going to train with you, I know we think always that we should do the best for our children, but we should consider do they have the money to do so? And these people, these therapists especially, not the parents usually, but the therapists will consider if I pay for a training, will I get my money back? Therapist. Can I invest? Should I invest? Should this investment eventually prove to be good for me? So, cost for training should be okay, culturally and country wise, let's say regulated on our part. I can't charge $150 for an hour of training to somebody from Nepal. Okay? So, we should be, let's say, more humane many times many aspects for a training and the fact is that the more let's say expert you become you will have less patience because your practice will become more expensive may include difficulty in gender issues like we said or men trainers are thought as more qualified trainers than women in some cases on the contrary may, men may not be considered suitable trainers as they are considered in some cultures to lack empathy towards children the same way that women can give motherly love. So in many cultures, men are deemed to be more practical and technical, okay, rather than therapeutical. Okay? And I've had that many times in my clinic, in my office, unfortunately. They told me, yes doctor, it's easy for you to say, do you have an autistic child? No. 
when I work with yours, more hours than you work with your job per day. Because I don't know if you have your job, I have another 14,000 children. And per day I work at least with eight to 10 children. So accumulatively, I work more hours. How many hours do you spend with your job? And I spend time with my children. I'm not behind the office. So when they realize that, that you have empathy, okay? You have to be kind, but let's say strict in some cases, so they understand that they cannot hide behind the difficulty because you're facing the same difficulty. Let me tell you something. Many times I have been swearing because the child wouldn't react to my term. Many times I have been having nightmares in the night because I was thinking the child doesn't do well. Is it my fault? So challenges, and that goes especially for Japan, intergeneration and Greece, intergenerational family involvement, as in many countries and cultures, like many, many different generations live in the same house. For example, when you go to Japan, the, old, the eldest woman is in charge of the house, and the same goes for Greece, who have many similarities. So what the grandmother would say, the yaya, what Yaya would say is the golden standard. Everybody has to abide. And sometimes the grandmother is right because she's experienced and she has seen a lot of things in her life and she knows that that child isn't going well. But in many other cases, it's not, it's not the case. Why? Because they say, let the child live. I will feed the child. And it's a five-year-old autistic child which is being fed by a spoon. Why? Because the grandmother said so. Because the parents are working. Because the parents are working, they have to rely on what? Yeah. On the grandmother. And competition. Once we train some therapists, they wouldn't actually let the other people to get trained in order to play the game as a monopoly in their country. I know it's strange. Okay? But they wouldn't actually let us train anyone else. Okay, so becoming more culturally integrated. We need to embed key elements without conflict. Early screen, not scream. Okay? <laughs> scream is done by children. Early intervention. Early intervention is a big thing for us. Early intervention, it is a cultural thing because some cultures find it hard to believe that their ch child, and parents, of course, it's normally, it's normal, but they find it hard to believe that their child has a problem. Diagnosis. Diagnosis can be also a cultural thing. How? Because when I went back to Greece and I told them that, our autists can be diagnosed in many cases from at the age of 18 months. They were telling, telling me that you're crazy, you don't know your work. I was telling them, no, I know, and it's evidence-based. Evidence-based. I'm sorry that you don't know, but you should be open-minded and see the literature and come back to me. That was from my colleagues. Family training involved with the whole family, which is something that is not always done. And results of parent training from Greece and Turkey. Okay, so we introduced PRT in Turkey. Okay, and it is really changed in the way autism is viewed, what tests and tools are done, which inter interventions are being used generally, like evidence based. The age of diagnosis has dropped. Okay, and time spent in therapy as well, because we have included the parents in the therapy. Final thoughts. In many cases, ABA would compete with traditional cultural practices and or religious beliefs. Okay, some patients of mine, okay, came to me with what? With exorcism. They actually took their children to the church to have them exorcised. What do you think about that? Okay, so what did I do? I told them, it's fine if you go to the church, it's fine if you, even if you do your exorcism, as long as you do what? Okay, you follow also my instructions. And I talked even to the priest, okay, who told them not to do the therapy because in one case, they went to a monastery, they got blessed by the priest, okay, by the priest, you know what they did? They actually quit the therapy because they said that God will help them. And I told them God will help you because I believe. But the problem is that you're getting help and you can't see it. 
ABAD or ABAD space method can be used as well meant Trojan horse, which means that through the therapy, you can actually implement like things like early intervention and early diagnosis. We should choose an ABA program which is easily adaptable in almost any setting, culturally adapt to the goals and involve low to help create the ability for the critical population, as we said. And sometimes in ABA, ABA may fail, not because it's not good, but because it requires many resources which are not available, like money, time, extra trainings, and knowledge of languages. The language is the only, let's say, asset that you have to have, otherwise won't, the therapy won't work if you're working with patients from abroad, like online or presential, like live. But other than that, if, you're, if you inquire about the culture and they let you in, and they trust you, okay? Like the Chinese community in Athens, they have trusted me, then they will follow you, okay? So, I'd like to thank you once more, okay? And I'm here for you for any question you may need. Any now, great or, question you want to ask, or also save some time for the later, after the full presentation, we have a Q&A, right? But if you feel you want to ask a question now, please do so. Yes. That's a very interesting question because I do. There is an acculturation index, okay, that might help you if you're living in the States. If you search Google or if you contact me, I can provide you with one. And I actually standardized an acculturation index for, for my PhD, which was done in Syracuse, Greece. But um, so, what does the acculturation index show? It shows whether the family has adapted well to the host country, okay? But I'm not quite sure that this acculturation index would work for online families from abroad. Okay, and that's the problem. So what we have seen is that more marginalized families, families that have not adapted well, and usually these are which families? Are families that the mother is a stay-at-home mother, stay-at-home mother, and doesn't speak the language of the host country. So these families do preserve their cultural values, okay, we can see that, but they are more reluctant in following, let's say, the host country's uh, the therapies in this case. They're more reluctant in following that something that is not culturally or religiously, let's say, uh, indicated by their community. But why? Not because of their beliefs, but because, and that's interesting, that's why I like the question, because they felt that if they follow something that is out of their culture, they will not belong actually to that culture, they will be gossiped. So may I ask, where, where do you come from, your origins? Oh, um, well, I was working in Greece for a while, yeah. population population. See? Um, Precisely. So what do we use? We use a Trojan horse in this case because Greece and Cyprus have per capita accepted the most refugees in the world lately. Okay, not from Somalia, but either from Nigeria and other countries and also from Syria lately. So what happens is that you can use a Trojan horse, which is food. We have found out that, that if you use food, like classes, you know, kitchen and stuff and uh, culinary stuff, they will open up to you, okay? But they will open up to you, especially uh, Somali refugees, because we do have some, if the teacher is a woman, woman to woman, okay? Yeah, you, you understand that, yes? Is this appropriate or not? Because you have the experience. Otherwise, if you're a man, they will, look, they will listen to you, they will look up to you, but they will not interact with you. Not in all cases, okay? Usually there is one woman who is the leader, okay? So if you approach that woman, she will disperse the information or she will give her thumbs up for letting the others talk, okay? I don't know if this is the case, but this is my experience. Yeah, no, definitely, because um, we're, we're seeing kind of a discrepancy between the male caretaker and the- Exactly.
Exacto. them together to us, that brings them closer, and we use also theater play. So I would like to thank you, I'm here for you, and be sure to add us on Instagram, okay, it's Dr. It's Sunny Fabulous, okay, and Dr. Dimitri, D-R-D-I-M-I-T-R-I. Okay. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So 
children with ASD had a wide age range from three to eight and a half. There was only one female in this study with autism. And there was a, also a large range of ASD symptomology according to the color scores and the binary scores. So this is what Okay, so now we'll talk about our experimental design procedures. A concurrent multiple baseline design was utilized across nine sibling dyads, and a random base, randomization technique was used by group randomization and intervention order. So essentially, sibling dyads were randomly placed into two different groups, and each of these groups had its own multiple baseline design, and the intervention order was also randomized. So next was the pre-baseline phase. And in this phase, we took some assessments, including a preference assessment that was conducted online with a reinforcer inventory. And this was to collect information on child preferences to build toy sets and price lists. Um, the CARS two-parent interview was conducted, and the mind interview was conducted as well. The pre-protest included autism awareness questionnaire, which assessed autism knowledge of the siblings, the sibling relationship questionnaire, and the adaptive self-efficacy questionnaire for children. And these were all done with the NT siblings. Next, we moved into our baseline phase. And so baseline data occurred in the homes via telehealth, and sessions occurred twice a week for 30 minutes. So the first 10 minutes was setting up the toy, saying hi, the next 10 minutes were the play group, and the last 10 minutes were playing with the adults and we may be commenting on what they were playing with or one of the parents joining in on the play and cleaning up the toys. There was also generalization probes that were conducted and this was used for their home toy sets and not the toys that the researcher provided. So dependent variables, what are we measuring? The first is the sibling fidelity and implementation and so look at the following strategy. Following the child's lead or providing a choice field, obtaining attention before providing directions, sharing information and persisting through play, and providing praise. And this was scored using a one minute partial interval system. The second dependent variable is the percentage of reciprocal play. And this was defined as being within three feet of each other, engaged in the same activity in an interdependent or shared play, and this can include handing materials, taking turns, or talking about the same. And this was scored using a 10 second whole interval procedure. So this was probably the most fun part of the study for me was building all these toy sets. So each toy set consisted of all the following toys dependent on preference assessments and space play assessment scores. So each toy set that was provided to the siblings had a pretend play set, something like an ice cream making kit, a cooperation or turn taking toy, including something like Pop the Pirate, and a building toy, something like Marble Run or Mapping Tiles. After baseline was conducted, we moved into intervention. So intervention consisted of behavior skills screening of the play strategies, and after that was conducted, five weekly intervention sessions were done. Each of these sessions was 30 minutes long, and the first 10 minutes consisted of checking in and priming the, the NT sibling of the play strategies they were going to be using. The next 10 minutes were play probe, Last 10 minutes, we're giving feedback to the NT sibling and giving prizes and stickers to both of the sibling dads for reaching their goals. Um, there's also generalization probes conducted in intervention as well. So behavior skills training was used via telehealth with NT siblings. And this included an explanation and rationale of the intervention strategies, a video model of the research of the intervention strategies being shown, a role play, so this included the NT sibling role play with the researcher and how they were going to incorporate the strategy playing with their autistic sibling, and then feedback, so providing feedback until that mastery criteria was hit. So here are the following strategies that we targeted during behavior skills training. So the first one was following the child's lead, giving choices, or using a choice wheel. The second strategy was obtaining attention before providing meaningful instructions. The third strategy was sharing information and persisting through play. And the fourth strategy was providing praise. So each of these strategies was individualized a bit to each dyad to fit what their specific needs were. Here are some examples of the video play tips that were used for priming before the intervention session started. So each of these play tips was individualized to the NT sibling's interest, and we used these before and after each of the play groups. 
The second part of the intervention was the sibling support group. So this was an eight-week curriculum online with half of the NT siblings that participated. So the structure of this looked at um, the welcome session, ASD characteristics, attention and fairness, exploring the sibling experiences, listening to feelings, and coping strategies was broken into two weeks, along with a wrap-up. So each um, social support group started off with an icebreaker, so a way for all the siblings to interact with each other. Then we went into a leading question and a comment. So a comment was utilized for each week um, that kind of hit on the topic in a fun and engaging way. And then we had a discussion, an activity, a wrap-up, and an introduction of that take-home activity for the next week. intervention was completed, we moved into the meeting, maintenance with phase. So this was two to four weeks follow-up probes were con conducted, and this was identical to baseline procedures in which there was no priming or no providing feedback or no prizes. Um, the diets also used were home toys instead of the toys that provided. So here are the results. Again, to remind you, the first research question is looking at is there a functional relation between sibling behavior skills training and So there is a lot of data here. I know everyone does not love data and graphs as much as I do, so I will not go into it as heavily as I usually do. But I just kind of wanted to show some of the data. So on our um, x-axis we have sessions, and on our y-axis we have percentage of play strategies and percentage of reciprocal play. So the circles that you see are percentage of reciprocal play, and the squares indicate fidelity. The open circles and squares indicate generalization probes in which the home toys were used. So here's the first dyad, Angela and me. We kind of see a little bit closer, but look here. And you can see in baseline, we have variable and low levels of both of those dependent variables, and in intervention, we have an increase in level. However, something to note is our follow-up probe did drop back down to almost baseline. Next, we have Amy and Sheldon, and you can see a decreasing trend in baseline for reciprocal play and fidelity. And while data is a little bit variable for reciprocal play and intervention, there is an increase in level and an increase in trend. Again, however, you can see that drop in this follow up data. Here's the data for satellite clusters. We have low levels of percentage of play and fidelity and baseline, and an increasing trend in both variables during intervention. Here's the data for Steve and Emily. Again, you can kind of see a similar pattern of lower levels of reciprocal play and fidelity with increasing trends in intervention. Again, also notice here that drop in that maintenance phase. And here is the last dia for this multiple baseline for Optimum Hill House. We have an increase in level and intervention for both of the dependent variables. And again, we have that drop in that follow up probe. So here's the second multiple baseline design. Again, we can kind of see similar patterns, decreases in baseline with increasing trends and in intervention. Um, here's Ron and Wyatt, and you can also see a, you know, really low levels in baseline here, essentially. There was not a lot of strategies being used, and essentially no reciprocal play was occurring during baseline. And while there's a small increase, we do have an increase in level during the intervention. However, that follow-up does drop again to baseline. So here's Carla and Perry. Um, they were a diet that had an increasing trend in both reciprocal play and fidelity of implementation. So since we have this increase in baseline trend, no intervention was given to this diet. And here is our last diet, Oscar and Stanley. So again, low levels in baseline with an increasing trend in intervention. And again, notice that drop in that follow up probe. Okay, so this is looking at a table of the NT siblings. So this pre-post assessment indicated positive results for both groups. So the group receiving behavior skills training only and the group receiving behavior skills training with a sibling support group. So the majority of NT siblings in both groups reported increases in sibling relationship quality and self-efficacy. Siblings in the support group demonstrated increases in ASD knowledge. Increases in the sibling 
relationship should follow even smaller across both groups with gains of 31.6 and 32. This suggests that the play intervention alone could be enough to increase the perceived relationship quality between siblings. Increases in self-efficacy assessment were higher for the multiple baseline one, the group that received both the support group and behavior skills training, compared to the other group at 22 during the post-assessment phase. So even though both groups received behavior skills training, siblings in the support group had higher scores in the post-assessment, which could indicate the support group had an additive effect on self-efficacy for playing with their brother or sister at ASD. So now coming to the discussion. So preliminary findings suggest there is a functional relation between the play and intervention and increases in reciprocal play, as well as fidelity and implementation for MT siblings. In terms of the support group, the findings were rated overall positive for both MT siblings and parents in the direction of acceptable, effective, and feasible. So limitations in future directions. So one of the limitations um, that I really noticed really want to work on in the future is there was that decrease in level of siblings' behaviors and fidelity of implementation and percentage of reciprocal play during that follow growth. So what is happening here in that maintenance time that we're making that you know, dependent variable drop. One suggestion that more something I want to look at is the priming or the availability of play tips as a visual prompt may be pertinent for NT siblings to maintain their use of play strategies. So remember, these children are from ages 5 to 11, so we might need to have extra supports built in just as that, you know, layer of support throughout. Uh, parents and NT siblings also self-reported not using the play tips outside the research sessions often. So something we want to really look at is how can we increase this family involvement outside of these research intervention sessions. So I really think there is a dire need to include parents within this training. So training parents on how to kind of have a sibling cooperation and play might be a really important next step to really maintain those skills that we were seeing in intervention. Okay, here are my references. And then here's my email. So I'll keep this up for a little bit. Um, feel free to email me. Um, I have a ton of materials. I'll email you the slides as well. And thank you. Any three questions before we move to the next speaker? Or you want to hold off? Yeah, go ahead. Speaker, Dr. Kim. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sunny Kim, and I'm so excited to be here today to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is targeting social skills. But really, how do we help our kids socialize and how do we ensure generalization? Before I get started on this topic, I do want to say socialization is really hard and it's tiring. I mean, being at this conference the last three days, I'm like, I have to practice what I preach. I have to be social, I have to network, I have to say hi to people, and I better do it because I make my clients do it. I make my students with autism do it, so they're having, they're being forced to do it, I better do that as well. So, the re this was my dissertation for a parent professional training because one of the things I noticed is I can go into the school setting, I can put these amazing interventions, but it's not generalizing. So how can I get our students to socialize and how can I get that to stick within the school system? Um, so with that being said, paraprofessionals, they're great, fantastic resources that are oftentimes being underutilized. Um, interestingly, uh, due to the increase in students with autism entering public school settings since 1992, I think there's over like an 800% increase in the United States with students with autism you know, entering public schools. That means we have seen a huge increase in the use and utilization of paraprofessionals. Unfortunately, there's a ton of literature 
that states that we're underutilizing these paraeducators, um, especially when paraeducators are assigned to be one-to-one -one support staff for these students. Specifically, there's one article that was published in 2015 where they compared the effects of paraprofessionals, where if paraprofessionals are specifically assigned to students with autism, like so they're one-to-one -one for that one student, they're being, being utilized maybe 50, about 50 to 55% of the time. So that means anywhere from 45 to 50% of the time, we're underutilizing the parents. And what are the parents doing when they're not, you we're not utilizing the parents? They're usually on their phone, or they're doodling, you know, they're kind of not really doing their job. So that's an issue. Whereas that same study found when parents are assigned to work with a group of students, their effectiveness goes up 97, 98% of the time. Something to think about. Additionally, as we've seen the role of paraprofessionals, um, well, as we've seen a great influx of the use of paraprofessionals, the role of these paraeducators have changed since 1992. Um, you know, maybe in the early 90s, paras were responsible for supporting the academic needs, but now with all these litigations happening, paras are responsible for providing ABA-based services, providing academic support, providing social support, you know, even some health-related support. So paraeducators have quite a bit of responsibility when it comes to supporting our students. Unfortunately, um, even though the role and the responsibilities of these paraeducators have shifted, there's not a lot of training for these paraeducators. Um, research has really well documented that this is an ongoing issue. Paraeducators go get assigned and it's like, you know, they make the least amount of money in the public school settings or even in private schools. And yet they're given one of the most challenging roles with very little support and supervision. I was talking to an RBT recently and she said, you know, I did the 40 hour training. I was so excited. I show up to my first day, you know, and I quit because this child was so aggressive. I had no idea how to support this student and my BCBA was nowhere to be seen and I was crying. And I was like the third RBT working with the student this school year. And why? It's because we're not properly supporting them. So that's an issue. And one of the things that I see is like, you know, you know I do a lot of school-based consultation and when I go to the schools, I can exactly pinpoint which students are special ed students because the paraeducators are like their glue. They're like right there, it's like, oh, okay, you probably have autism because your para is right next to you and they're like your shadow. And how is that gonna help in terms of the socialization you know, between students with ASD and their you know, typically developing peers? It's not really gonna help. So with all of these issues in mind, I wanted to, you know, really assess, like, can we train paraprofessionals? Can we train them to fidelity, really to target that social piece? And I think socialization, and maybe I'm biased because, you know, for me, I think socialization is so important. And it's actually well documented in the literature that social communication is what's really going to help our students after high, after school, after, you know, whether they're getting a job, whether it's being in a, a relationship, it's really that social communication skill that's really going to help them be successful later on in life. Um, and it's so unfortunate when I work with high school students, middle school students, where their social skills, it's like, how come we didn't work on this when you were in kindergarten? How come we didn't work on this when you were in first grade? And, you know, by the time they're, 10th grade, 11th grade, I have a lot of students that are really severely depressed or that they have suicidal ideation. And all of it comes back to having poor social skills, not knowing how to make friends. Um, it's, you know, doing this line of research for over the last 10 years, I've, I've gone into school settings and I've seen my clients get bullied by their peers. You know, awful comments like, oh, you're so weird, no one wants to hang out with you, things like that. And I was like, right here. I can't believe you're actually saying those comments. So I think targeting those social skills early on is so important, but unfortunately the reality is in schools, it's like kind of like a second thought. It's like the afterthought. It's like, no, we need to focus on the math. We need to focus on the reading skills. We need to focus on, you know, the writing skills. I'm like, okay, that's all great, but if they have poor social skills, how are they going to have a relationship? How are they going to hold a job? How are they going to be successful outside of the educational sector? Um, you can be the smartest person, but if you have poor social skills, like you're gonna have a hard time outside of the school bubble. 
Um, so with that, I really wanted to, you know, see can I train paraprofessionals to really focus on the social skills for students with autism and teach them the appropriate social skills so that they can have friends, so that they know how to communicate, they know how to, they understand what it means to have true friendship. Um, and then the secondary kind of question I wanted to investigate was if I train these parents, is that going to lead to a more social child? So for this method, um, I had three dyads, the dy dyads being a para and a student with autism. And across the board, they were all white uh, paraprofessionals. They range, you know, they're in their late 20s, early 30s. They all had a bachelor's degree. And none of them had a whole lot of training. Maybe some had like a workshop through their district, but nothing like super intensive. And then for the children, um, I had grades kindergarten all the way up to fifth grade. They're all diagnosed with autism. The one thing I do want to highlight is their cognitive level. They all happen to be kind of in that average or above average range of superior. But if you look at their social skills um, scale, it's all kind of low. It's in the 9th or 37th percentile. So, you know, that's kind of low compared to the cognitively they're pretty high, but socially they're pretty low. And so I really wanted to take their preferred interests. So can I take children with autism's preferred interests and incorporate that into a fun social activity that the parents can actually facilitate? And so this intervention was done in a school setting. Everything was in natural, you know, in the actual school setting. And the materials we used, again, I wanted to incorporate the student with autism's preferred interests. So we kind of assessed like, hey, what does student one like? What does student two like? What does student three like? And we came up, came up with these fun, kid-friendly activities. I should also mention that the participants in this particular study were in elementary school. So for my first uh, dyad, this student was really into Legos, dinosaurs, and you know, we said, great, let's use that. That's a strength of his. These are things he's very comfortable with. So let's use his strength and build a fun social activity around that. For my second dyad, this was my kindergartner. He was into this specific, uh, I don't know, alpha friends. I don't know if you guys have heard of alpha friends, but the very specific uh, alpha friends uh, characters. And so he said, okay, we can use that. He was into some other, you know, games like Talk of Pirate, Honey Tree, Mega Blocks. So we had a few, he had a few different interests that we were able to use. And then for my third dyad, he was into car, car parts. Candyland, foosball table, um, and this was my fifth grader. For my study, I had a few different measures. I looked at paraprofessional measures, so can they be trained to fidelity? And if I train them, am I gonna see, you know, a difference in the level of social prompting they're providing their students? That was kind of like, is this an added bonus? If they're trained to fidelity, am I gonna see them prompting them more appropriately? Uh, and then the secondary measures we're looking at student with autism, like are they, am I gonna see an increase in uh, engagement, social interactions with their peers, as well as am I gonna see initiations? Am I gonna see more initiations? Meaning like, hey, come play with me. Hey, do you wanna play you know, this game with me? Because initiations is considered a pivotal behavior. And so if we have trained parent professionals, am I gonna see these improvements in the students with autism? And then I also looked at social validation measures because one of the big things is I want this intervention to be easy enough for the paraeducators to implement. Additionally, I also took some social validation measures from the special education teachers who are their bosses because I want to say, hey, if this bed teacher is on board, then they're more likely to use this type of training to train their future paraeducators. And then I also took some data on the typically developing peers that participated in this uh, intervention in this program because I wanted them to also enjoy and have fun participating. Uh, we collected 30, uh, reliability data, 33% across all sessions. I know that's higher than standard, but you know, go for the, shoot for the aim, whatever that saying is, but we went above and beyond. Um, and we wanted at least 80% fidelity for all of our paraeducators. So the design was a non-concurrent multiple baseline design. I know this is like the boring research stuff, so I'll kind of gloss over it. The procedure baseline, I went and I observed. I wanted to see what are my students doing? How are the paraeducators supporting these students? Um, so nothing was changed. I was kind of like a ghost in the background, just collecting data and videotaping and getting all of that good information. They didn't really know who I was. They just thought I was maybe like an administrator from the district. Um, and then for the procedure, we st I started off by providing them a training workshop. 
The training workshop was 90 minutes, and in some instances, I did have to break it up into two training workshops because of the union and the whole, you know, like teacher or paraeducators have a specific amount of time. I, in some instances, I did have to break it up into two 45 minute workshops. The training was multi component in a sense that the paraeducators were showing video clips of like good support system and not so good support ways of supporting students. So, you know, the good thing, the good way of providing social support and not so ideal ways of providing social support. I also provided them more case vignettes because I wanted them to give me feedback in terms of like if you had a student with this profile, like how would you support them socially? So I'm like, are they able to apply what they learn in the training? in these situations. And then um, the actual training workshop talked about, you know, like do's and don'ts. Like the biggest thing I really wanted to target was the proximity. Because again, every time I go into a school setting, it's like the parents are a glue stick. They're right next to their students. It's like, that's an issue. I also talked about how do you set up cooperative arrangements? So what does that look like when you're really facilitating the social interaction? Um, and we talked about like the different levels of prompting and how do we make socialization fun? Because the last thing we want our students to feel is that socialization is a chore, socialization is like another math curriculum. Socialization should be a fun thing. So how can we make socializing a fun experience for students with autism? Um, and then the very last part of the training was the paras had to come up with a list of all the activities that their assigned student was really into. Um, after the training, the paraeducators were given about 10 days to come up with this lunch club idea. So they had to gather all of the materials, they had to recruit the students, and oftentimes they created a flyer that they put around the school campus. And clubs are such a great thing because, you know, at least in the States, a lot of schools have clubs. And the, you know, we, in some instances, we've had to add sign up sheets because, you know, I've had some of, the, uh, some of these clubs where I have 30 elementary students coming and I'm like, oh, that's way too many kids, you know? Um, and so we definitely had to create a sign up sheet just to kind of limit the number of students that would want to participate. Um, sometimes we would announce it to the class, but we tried to make it available to the entire grade sometimes maybe to the entire school, but we also learned that if you make this fun activity available to the entire school, then like I said, you'll get like 50 students wanting to participate. Um, so after the uh, training, the initial training, they were given 10 days, they were, you know, they had to gather all the materials, they had to figure out, okay, how do I set up cooperative arrangements, because that's something that was covered in the workshop. So they were given all of that time. So then I, 10 days later, I went and I observed, I took data. Are they, is their proximity level appropriate? Did they set up and maintain cooperative arrangements? Are they prompting appropriately? So I was looking and assessing for all of these skill sets. If they met fidelity that first time I observed, then I'm like, awesome, I gave them feedback, and I you know, went back and I observed again, and if they met fidelity for three consecutive times, then I considered them to be trained in this, you know, setting up the social interventions. If they did not meet fidelity, then I had to give them corrective feedback. I modeled how to do it, gave them some suggestions, they had to tweak it, and that was repeated until they were able to meet fidelity for three consecutive observations. Um, after that, um, I did a three, uh, three weeks later, I did a follow-up to, to see if they were still maintaining fidelity. And then I wanted to see, um, were they able to generalize to other skills, specifically more for paraprofessionals, all of the paraprofessionals. So if they're able to set up this type of social intervention, are they able to set up other types of social activities for their students? So here's the results. Um, so all, so my paraprofessional one and paraprofessional two were able to quickly meet fidelity of implementation, and both paraprofessional one and paraprofessional, or paraprofessional three, they, uh, she was able to maintain fidelity and she was able to generalize it to other activities, so that was fantastic. My paraprofessional too, she needed a little more support, a little bit more training, so she had a hard time meeting fidelity of implementation, um, but essentially with a few additional support, she eventually met fidelity and she was able to maintain uh, fidelity of implementation. Paraprofessional one, she did great, she was able to meet fidelity um, and she was able to, you know, maintain it, but she wasn't able to quite generalize it to other skills. It was better than baseline, 
um, because baseline was completely zero, but it wasn't at that fidelity level that I wanted to see. Um, in terms of the social problems by parents, this was, again, this isn't something that I'm intentionally measuring, but surprisingly, to my surprise, all three paraprofessionals, their level of social prompting improved, meaning that they're now able to prompt the students, like, hey, like, this kid looks like he wants to play with you, let's go interact with this kid, or hey, you know, hey, buddy, like, our friend Johnny wants to play, let's all play together, so they are now starting to prompt both the student with autism, and they're typically developing peers to socialize with one another, which is an added bonus. When I gave out the social validity um, questionnaire, one of the big things I wanted to look was, how much do you like working in this field? And all three said, you know, they like it. They really love working in this field, as indicated by a rating of one. And I asked, you know, um, how happy are you in general? And they all said they're, you know, somewhat happy to not happy. So it's interesting because they love working in this field, but their happiness was, you know, kind of in the middle. Um, additionally, then I asked, um, you know, in terms of this specific training, how do you view it? And they all, you know, para ones that I, and I asked, you know, what was the most helpful part of this training? Para ones that I feel that the most helpful part of the training was the feedback and tips. Para two said feedback and extra tips, and para three were activity suggestions. So this suggests that, in general, parents need some guidance. They need some support in terms of what type of activities would encourage good social interactions. And if we can give those suggestions, then they can actually implement it. Um, I also gave out a questionnaire to the special education teacher, usually the case managers, because they're in charge of the paraeducators in general. And I wanted to read some quotes that these paraeducators said. What is your um, opinion on these individualized lunch clubs? The first teacher said, it works very well for the student with special needs, as well as their typical peers. Upper elementary students tend to lose interest in the playground activities and need something to do with, stru uh, with structure that engage them. It is easy to implement to encourage peer interaction and gives the adults a clear focus on how to assist them. And I think that summarized you know, the intent of my research, right? I wanted to create that something easy enough to implement, but that's going to ensure positive social interactions between students with autism and their typically developing peers. The second SPED teacher said, these lunch clubs are fantastic. It gives all students the chance to expand their social skills and to know others in a fun way. I think it's a very effective and positive way for students to have semi-structured peer interactions. The very last SPED teacher said, these clubs are an important investment in bridging the gap between typical peers and students in special education. Um, so that was very, you know, all of these were very powerful statements that the SPED teachers made because it's indicated that they're more likely to then train their future paraeducators to be able to implement it. In fact, I have a great anecdotal story. So one of the paras um, and the SPED team, they loved it so much that their entire school decided to adopt this model. And so they have a weekly schedule of structured activities for all students to participate in. And I thought that was fantastic. And this school did their own research and they found that when they provide two to three different structured activities during recess time, it lowers the, um, it lowers the injuries that are happening on the playground. Because students are now, like you get maybe 30 to 40% of students now engaged in these structured activities. So that reduces the liability of these students getting hurt out on the playground. So I thought that was some cool anecdotal data. Um, in terms of students with autism, I wanted to look at are they now, like if they have better trained parents, are we gonna see improved social engagement? And that's exactly what we saw. Um, for, so the gray bars really depict the typical range, you know, typical range of social engagement. And we want all of our students to ideally fall within that gray, gray range. As you can see, for participants, uh, for student one and three, they were able to reach that typical level of engagement. Participant two kind of struggled, but it was an improving trend. Uh, same results with the initiations. Um, in fact, all three participants ended up reaching that typical range of initiation, so that was really exciting. When I surveyed the students with autism, they all said they love having the lunch club and it all makes them feel very happy when they're able to participate in this type of activity. Um, I also surveyed the typically developing peers that did participate in these activities and it was the same response. 
they all loved it, it was fun, and it made them feel happy. So that's very good validation from the consumers. So I'm gonna show you a clip of what this looks like. So the first clip is baseline, it's a, a para and student dyad, and you're gonna see, please notice the proximity issues, please notice what the student with autism is doing, um, and then it's gonna go into the uh, kind of like post-intervention, like once the para is trained, notice how well the para has generalized the skills and the student is socializing and you can't really see the para in the second 